All right, the organization of the church. How is a church structured? Turn the page to 314, and we have three major forms of church government. This is how the church historically has uh, organized itself and made decisions. Church governance is generally around setting direction and making decisions. And so you have the Episcopal form. Uh, this would be uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church, even the Methodist Church, where bishops are over districts, over multiple sets of churches, and so forth and so on. Generally, they embrace some form of apostolic succession, though within the Methodist tradition, that might not be uh, the case. Lutheran Church would probably fall within this category as well. You're familiar with congregational churches. Congregational churches, the authority is w not with select individuals or, or with offices, but with the entire congregation. And so there are church, congregation, church congregational meetings whereby they vote on decisions and so forth. Uh, your Baptist background or congregational churches where uh, all of the authority rests within the entire uh, assembly. Presbyterian churches... Uh, Reformed churches, some Bible churches, this particular fellowship Bible falls under the Presbyterian form where you, uh, the church is governed by a group or a board of leaders often called elders. This is a representative form of church rule where church direction is determined by appointed, recognized, or however they're selected, appointed uh, leadership who serve at the pleasure of the body. And so those are your three primary now, within that, you have some churches that are congregational, but the fact is the deacons are in charge. Just ask them. Or in some churches, uh, a senior leader is in charge. Just try to go against him. So you can be, in theory, any of these three. Uh, what's always interesting is in the practicality of it, who has the authority to make decisions? Uh, Chip Jackson and I have the privilege of representing fellowship and doing a, a good amount of consulting. And one of the things we generally get to is who within your church structure has the authority to make decisions, to make the ultimate decisions. And finding out the answer is always really instructive because governance has to do with pointing the direction and then who has the right to make decisions and then empower others to implement that decision. And that's the way we're structured here uh, at Fellowship, uh, in, a, in a board of elders who have the ultimate authority, and then they empower uh, church leaders, staff and non-staff. Now, back on page 313, we, we now move to the leaders of the church. And what we're going to discuss is that there are two broad categories of leaders in the, uh, in the, uh, in the New Testament church. One group we're going to call elders, though the New Testament uses a number of different words for them. We'll say elders. And then the second group is deacons, parenthesis, deaconesses, question mark. So is there one office of deacon, or does that also mean, is, is a deaconess a wife of a deacon, or is a deaconess a counterpart to a deacon? And we're going to look at that because there is one biblical passage that leans into that kind of thinking. Let's look at the elders, first of all, by turning to page 315. And I've given you on 315 and the backside of it on 316 uh, the qualifications, these 20 qualifications combining 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 uh, for a person who would be a leader. If you were to examine these very carefully and use what we call the leader profile, that every leader has to have knowledge, skill, character, and then passion, vision. And if you were to try to pinpoint these 20 qualifications into the profile of a leader, they will predominantly cluster in one of those four quadrants. It's either in knowledge, skill, character, or passion, vision. Which do you think it might be? It's character. And the premise out of that might be this, or, or the implication of that might be is godly men make godly decisions that you don't necessarily need the most influential, the most wealthy, the most popular, the most powerful, etc. What you want are people with godly character because godly men tend to make godly decisions. And if they need expertise, they can then go to the body and say, does anybody have expertise in this area or this area or this area? 
but you want to affirm men who have the biblical qualifications in order to set the direction and make the decisions appropriate to a local body. Now, on page 317, uh, I want to point out that there are five biblical words that refer to the one office of elder. Five different biblical words. And we, we call it the office of elder because elder, uh, presbuteros, or presbyter, occurs more often than any other word. So 16 times in the New Testament, we see the Greek word presbuteros. We get our word presbyterian from that word. It just basically means elder. The implication is one with wisdom, one with dignity, one with maturity. So elder. Overseer is the Greek word episkopos. Uh, we get our word episcopal out of that. It's sometimes translated overseer, sometimes translated bishop. All right? The word pastor is the Greek word poimen. But understand that uh, the word poimen in the Greek language means shepherd. So why do we call it pastor? Well, if you go from the Greek language, poimen, into the Latin language, into English, it comes out pastor. Because in Latin, the uh, English word is something like pastore or something to that effect. But that's where we get the word pastor. The word pastor really means, in the etymology of it, just means shepherd. So pastor equals shepherd. Three times that word is used. Then there are two other words that seem to refer to the same general function. And that is ruler or presider. Uh, hegemai, which means ruler or leader. Prohistimi means one who stands before or presides before, uh, and it is also used. Now, we have two passages, Acts 20 and 1 Peter 5, where at least three of these words are used to refer to the one office, okay? Which tells us that the office can be described by several different words. Any of those four that, or five that we mentioned earlier but in the biblical text, notice Acts 20. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the whom? For the elders. He tells the elders, verse 28, Keep watch over yourselves, all the flock which the Holy, Holy Spirit has made you. What's the word? Overseers. And then he says, be shepherds. In other words, pastor the church of God. So three separate words used of the one office. Are you with me? All right, now look at uh, 1 Peter 5, same thing. To the elders, Peter writes, plural, uh, verse 2, be shepherds of God's flock, serving as overseers. So those underlined words all show that they are used synonymously. Are you with me on that? So if we tried to summarize based on the, what the words mean, if we summarize the broad stroke responsibilities of the ruling body, the elders, this is what we would come up with at the bottom of the page. The word elder is used the most, so we're going to use that as our operative word. That means maturity, dignity, wisdom. These men who have those biblical qualifications, those godly qualifications, they have three broad functions. They're going to do more than this, but here are their broad functions. An elder board is to be about overseeing, shepherding, and ruling or, or, or leading or presiding over the body. Does that make sense? Turn the page uh, to page 318, and let's expand that idea and bring in the head of the church, Christ, who's the head of the body. And so the ruling authority in a local church, uh, based on our understanding of the New Testament, is that Christ, who is the living word, answers the question, who's the ultimate authority of the church? It's Christ. When I was serving as an elder uh, and... Uh, all throughout the uh, 28 or so years that I was an elder at fellowship, uh, it was not uncommon at the end of a meeting, in the middle of a meeting, for us to simply stop and pray. And a part of our prayer would be, would be, Lord, this is your church. It doesn't belong to us as the elders. It doesn't belong to any group of people. Lord, this is your church. We need your wisdom on making a really, really tough decision. It was a way for us to acknowledge once again that Christ is the head of the church, not a group of men or individuals or, or powerful personalities or charismatic individuals or whatever it might be. Christ, the living word, we all bow the knee before him. And the second part of that, uh, beneath the word Christ, living word, uh, living word, we have the written word. How does Christ primarily communicate what the church should be doing in specifics? Well, the biblical functions are found in the New Testament. 
And so this tells us what the church is supposed to be doing. So you have the authority of Christ through the Scripture. We could even put on there through the guidance of the Holy Spirit if you wish. But Christ through the Scriptures and then the elders beneath the authority of Christ in the Scriptures who have the job of overseeing, shepherding, and ruling. Or we might say it this way, administrative oversight, pastoral care, and strategic leadership. Every elder board was going to have to make a decision if the church grows. And the decision that every elder board will have to make, a ruling body of uh, a plurality of elders, they're going to have to make this decision. Are we going to micromanage the church or are we going to macro lead the church? When it's small, you can get away with micromanaging. When it gets large, and I'm talking about really, really large, then uh, you're going to have to learn how to macro lead a church. Because here are the three things that go with macro leadership. Listen to this. Number one, the elders are responsible before Christ and under Christ to see that all spiritual needs of the church body are met. Do you agree with that? The elders are responsible before Christ and under Christ to see that all the spiritual needs of the church body are met. Yes. Two, the elders cannot individually or as a board meet all the needs of the body of Christ. Now we're in a pickle. So three, therefore, the elders must produce and release leaders to meet the needs. Does that sound familiar? Produce and release spiritual leaders who know and express the authentic Christ in northwest Arkansas and the world. That's our missional driving statement here at Fellowship. It's the Great Commission. And it is also in harmony with our macro leadership view that the elders set the direction, make the governing decisions. They get counsel from uh, uh, senior leadership, staff and non-staff. They get counsel and wisdom and guidance, and then they present to the body the direction that they believe Christ in the Scriptures is pointing our body to go. That's the theory of it. That's the way that it's supposed to work. Now, on page 319, what you'll notice is I've taken each of those broad categories, overseeing, shepherding, and ruling, and I've broken them down into subpoints with Scripture verses. And I'll leave it to you to go back and see the handful of, ver uh, handful of statements about overseeing. Turn the page to 321. Handful of statements about the shepherding responsibilities in a macro leadership model. Turn the page. A handful of uh, statements about the ruling or presiding function uh, of, uh, of an elder board on page 323. All right? So let's uh, then move now to 325. We went quickly through that. Let's look at uh, deacons. You'll notice on the left-hand side of the page, here are the oh, roughly 10 qualifications of a deacon. And uh, what you'll discover uh, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, this is under the biblical passages, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints, the believers in Christ Jesus, in the local expression called Philippi, together with overseers, elders, right, with the, over, the leaders, and now we're introduced to a second office, and it's the office of deacon. Now, here's the interesting thing. There are at least eight or nine broad principles that elders are supposed to embrace as a part of their responsibility given in Scripture. How many specific deacon responsibilities do you think there are? Zero. The best you can come up with is the etymology of the word deacon, diakonos, which means table servant or servant. The idea, if you see number 3, Acts 6, in the middle of the page, if you see those as the first deacons, the best you can come up with is the deacons have a servant ministry role to the body and they are extensions of the leadership, uh, the extensions of the elders, such that the elders who cannot fulfill all of the spiritual needs of the church they then empower other leaders, recognized leaders, who then serve the body with the specific functions that have been delegated to them. All right? And so uh, 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 after we finish the lecture, someone's going to ask, do we have deacons at fellowship? And I'll answer it after, the, after we break. Turn to page 327. Deaconesses. Is there such a thing? 
Well, the biblical passage is Romans 16. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a, underline the word, servant. That is the word diakonos. She is a servant of the church in Sincrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, to give her help. Why? Uh, th th for she has been a great help. She's been serving within that body. And so the question is, is she a deaconess, or is she the wife of a deacon, or is she just simply a notable servant, not an office, but just a notable servant, Take notice of the fact that she really serves the body well. So those are your three options. She's a deaconess, she's the wife of a deacon, or she's just a remarkable servant and is, and is called a diaconess. If you want to see her as the wife of a deacon, you would look at 1 Timothy 3.11, which we have there. Women must be dignified. By the way, this is found within the listing of the qualifications of a deacon. And then it says women... Implication being, wives of deacons. Women must be likewise dignified, not malicious gossips, temperate, faithful in all things. So that qualification could, would fit the wife of a deacon or the office of deaconess. Either way. So the question in the middle of the page is, is this an office or is this a general ministry description? And I've given you a couple of arguments for on uh, page 27, if you'll turn the page. Gave you a couple arguments against. And that's a piece of gristle I will allow you to chew to your heart's content. 